My inaugural trip to a haunted attraction as a boy to a farm-themed hay maze with all the scarecrows and old barns and cheap animatronic crows with red eyes that you might expect. At the end of it, a theater kid dressed up as a hillbilly farmer who would chase you to the exit with a cap shotgun. Get out of here, you dang kids, he'd say in this Appalachian drawl that he had hysterically overdone. I'm coming for you. Y'all better run. The place was cheap. It was uh, low budget. Entirely ridiculous. And, and I fell in love with it all the same. So a year later, we visited another place. Miss Wretched's House of Horrors, it was called. Uh, I think it was down on uh, Gardersdale. That was an equally cheesy haunted mansion with pop-out skeletons and uh, suits of armor that dropped with their rubber axes near your feet. Which you'd, you'd trigger an oftentimes clang sound from this poorly hidden speaker. And I loved that experience too. So, uh, at my insistence, we got fake IDs the year after that. And with those gained admittance to the big kid haunt that was, was all the rage at that time. It was called Dark House. I remember the blood. This red vampiric font above the door quite clearly, and it was my first run-in with professional actors. Oh, and dirty words. (laughs) And pitch black halls. And chainsaws. Upon completion, 15-year-old me felt like he'd become a man. But as the years wore on, attractions like these lost their edge. And I tried to up the ante a bit. Truly, I did. I went on out of town, on these road trips to all the spookiest places in the state and beyond, as soon as I was old enough. Among the locales checked off this, in this period were various real haunted houses in which nothing happened. Several of those win a prize if you last the night spooks, in which I won simply by falling asleep. Two of those infamous adult haunted houses in Vegas, where you have to sign a waiver and be okay with extensive, but not really extensive, physical contact. Those were effective, to be sure, but after my second visit to one of those places, even those lost their merit in my eyes, I was starving for a legitimate scare by the age of 27. And that's when, on a deep web forum for like-minded adrenaline junkies, I first heard about an attraction known as Labyrinth. It was mentioned almost passively by another user. And when I pressed them for more information, the response was frustratingly vague. Can't tell too much, it said. They contact you, if you want in. Whatever. In my experience, there was rarely ever a payoff frightening enough to justify the type of gimmicky cloak and dagger nonsense. I closed the forum, forgot about it entirely by the end of the week, and then came the black envelope. Inside, There was a black letter, appropriately enough, and typed tastefully on it, in the inner sleeve, it said the word, Labyrinth. And beneath this, it provided an address, and a date, and a time. Given its name, I'd expected Labyrinth to be a a maze of sorts, or one of those escape rooms with a, um, a horror bent, but instead, I found myself staring up at a palatial chateau-esque estate of impossible size, with spires and towers and wings and various other gratuitous additions to the structure. It's truly magnificent. I'd visited North Carolina's Biltmore once, and that estate wasn't any more impressive than the one before me. On the door to the place was a second black letter that read simply, Labyrinth. Find the heart to escape. And despite my initial jaded skepticism, I now find myself quite intrigued. In the context of the location, I now found these vague letters more tasteful and reserved than gimmicky. So, it was with a strange optimism that I entered the place and shut the door behind me. It locked on its own with a faint click. There was no mechanism on its interior to unfasten it from what I could see. The interior of this place was every inch as magnificently structured and furnished as the outside would suggest. It was regal and immaculately clean. And 
It was empty. Hello? I said. An echo responded. I waited a bit before I spoke again. I'm Andrew Owens. I got a letter in the mail yesterday. It said to come here today at three, so... Uh, here I am. Nothing. I checked my phone for the first time, and it agreed with my punctuality. <sighs> I guess this is the game. I thought back to the letter. Find the heart to escape, it said. It was strange. It was vague. It was open to interpretation. And I mused on its possible meanings and reason that I had to somehow prove my courage, my heart, to be allowed out. The isolation. And that was a fresh twist. And so was that creeping thought that if something goes wrong, there's nobody here to help. It made me a bit afraid, and I loved it. I decided to explore. In no particular order of my visiting them, the mansion had on its first floor, and in the immediate vicinity of its parlor, a coat room, a sitting room that featured both two separate fireplaces and multiple redundant couch and table furniture sets. A grand study with a gorgeous, multi-thousand-dollar mahogany desk by the window, and more books in its floor-to-ceiling shelves than all but the largest public libraries and every single private collection that I'd ever heard of. A billiard room, a grand banquet hall with filled wine glasses at every seat of its table, a kitchen, and behind that with a fresh bowl of fruit on the counter, and a gallery in which various regal painted portraits of young and beautiful people were hung, who I assumed to be either the owners of the estate or relatives of those owners, although I didn't stop to see if there were informative plaques. A centerpiece portrait of a woman in a blue dress was particularly striking. Striking, but not frightening. Not that I wasn't particularly appreciative of I'd come here for a thrill, but the magnificence of this place aside, I wasn't sure what made it a fearful experience and not just an elaborate puzzle. But I got my answer shortly enough. I moved from the billiard room to the coat room, and from the coat room to a long hallway that was, like the others, fit with cushioned benches on the side of it and Persian rugs and a, a grand player piano that provided a pleasant enough tune and the only sound beside my own footsteps. And then I opened the door at the end of the hallway, and I found myself, bizarrely enough, back in the billiard room. I stopped cold. Now, I hadn't taken so much as a single turn since I'd arrived at the building, much less in the quick minute since the last time that I'd been in that room, but here I was all the same. The first thought was, Okay, so, so, so that's the twist then. They built identical rooms to create an illusion of going in circles, but... But that theory was, was frustrated by the fact that everything matched everything, from the pattern of the balls on the table, to the order of the cues on the rack, to the way the chalk was placed on the windowsill, and the stain that it had left there. Then I reasoned, it's, it's an architectural trick, I think. The halls are curved ever so slightly to give the impression of being straight, when in reality they're turning you every which way and circling you back around to the other rooms. Hence the name Labyrinth. I was impressed, truly. Genuinely impressed. Not scared, really, but I'd been tricked and surprised. And even a seasoned critic like myself had to admit that the twist was indeed effective. Maybe this place isn't such a dud after all. So I moved through the room and I opened the door at the far end that led back into the hallway. And I walked straight into the old study that I'd been in 15 minutes and six rooms earlier. My heartbeat skipped a step. And for the first time, I was... I was unable to muster up any explanation as to... as to explain this phenomena. No amount of subtle hallway twisting could account for this. I decided at least to test the extent of this trick. While still standing in the billiard room, I shut the door, and I opened again to find not the study, but a new hallway instead. When I shut it a third time, I opened it to find a bedroom, and, and after the fourth such attempt, I was staring into the kitchen. My revelations followed. 
That place, while otherwise identical to its former self, was beginning to decay. I slid my fingers across the surface of the kitchen counter and rubbed it against my thumb. Dust sprinkled onto my trousers. Dust, and not a, not a negligible amount of it, in a room that I'd noted earlier for its immaculate cleanliness. I felt that, that old damn dread mounting up, and this time I was powerless to swallow it. And the door there led me not into the banquet hall, but into the sitting room again. And like the kitchen before it, it was dirtier than it was before. Not filthy, but it was certainly lived in. A crooked picture frame, a pillow on the floor, cup rings on the table, the, the blanket that had been neatly folded on the couch the first time I'd been here was now crumpled up against the arm of the seat. It was then, though, that I got an idea. Leave the door open behind me to keep an open avenue of escape. The rooms can't change if the doors are open, right? So I left it hanging halfway and moved to the door at the other end of the living room. But I stopped when I reached it. What awaited me wasn't the billiard room, or the kitchen, or the galley, or the bedroom, but the, the sitting room again. The very, the very same room in which I stood even filthier now, and standing in the door at the far end was myself. Again, leaning halfway through the threshold in what was a perfect mirror of exactly my stance and exactly my demeanor, I turned around behind me and then, sure enough, I could see myself there too, looking back into another version of what was no doubt the same room from the door I'd just, I'd just come through. Hello, I said. I and a chorus of me's said at the same time. I slammed the door in a panic when that happened and threw into action my second plan. A forced break out through the window at the end of the room. I, I picked up the chair and let out a shout. I'm fucking done with this place. And then I hurled the chair at full strength into the glass. It bounced off without so much as a scratch and it tumbled onto its side. I turned around and lifted it up again for a second toss, but but I stopped before I did. Sitting propped up on its two ends, on the surface of the table and clean, and midst all the dust was a third black letter. No cheating, it read. Find the heart to escape. I blinked. I felt sick. I felt my heart beat in my throat, and I, I backed up, and then, after a brief pause, I, I began to run. Through door after door, I went to find the parlor, but it was a fruitless effort. The billiard room led to the banquet hall, led to the coat room, led to the portrait gallery, to the bedroom, and each chamber entered featured more disorder and more ruin and, and more decay than the one before. The wood had rotted, the light bulbs were dead, there was cobwebs and spiders in the corner, but not once did the parlor present itself, and after the third passed through the study, I collapsed by the leg of the desk to catch my breath. It was then, in a bizarre stroke of luck, that I looked to the other end of the room and I saw that one of the grand bookshelves had snapped under the weight of age and collapsed, spilling its books to the ground and crushing a corpse. But it was old. I realized that when I inspected the body up close. It looked like the thing had laid there for decades by the time I found it. Long enough for the smell to wash away, for the clothes to rot off, but in its hand was what appeared to be a dust-covered book of sorts, or a tome, or a collection of notes. I picked it up, I flipped it open, and I began to read it. And after some searching, I found the following relevant passage. I found the pattern to the runes. Took me goddamn forever, but I found it. Just gotta make sure to run to the door when I'm done. Beneath that, there was a scribbled diagram of sorts, where a task in a certain room would lead to another. Light fireplace in living room, kitchen. Eat from the fruit bowl, pool room. Pocket the eight ball, coat room. Find the key in the pocket of the right coat, banquet hall. Drink from the chalice, portrait gallery. Make it through. Study. Spin the globe to match the... And the notes ceased at that precise moment. I can only imagine 
It was then that the shell fell, perhaps purposefully by some mechanism or perhaps because of sheer age and the absence of maintenance, and crushed the author. How long they'd laid there, I couldn't tell, and at the moment, shamefully, I didn't quite care. I was simply worried about avoiding the same fate for myself, so I crept around the study to the desk, and while I did, the floor creaked and it moaned and it protested with each and every step, and I made it. Luckily. And when I did, I placed my hand on the globe and I spun it once without purpose. Match the globe to the what? I searched for a bit before I found an old 18th century cartographer's map, yellowed and weathered and worn like the globe and ripped a bit at the far edges of it. The far edge of the room and above another shelf, I looked back down at the globe and I nudged it left until both it and the map depicted a new world in the middle. I guess that's good enough. And just then, something hit my head and tumbled to the floor. I looked at the ground and found a book there. And then I looked up just in time for another book to fly from one of the other listed shelves and it hit me in the forehead. And then came another book and another and another. It quickly became impractical to dodge them all. I simply put my hands over my head and made for the exit. And as I did, the trickle of falling books became a stream and that stream became a waterfall and the waterfall became an avalanche that consumed the room utterly. From every shelf of every standing case in in the room, books flew off the shelves and they, they began to pool on the ground before filling it up and flooding it. And the torrent rose like the ocean tide and I climbed over the piling mountains of the stuff and was battered hideously as I did. My vision swam, my ribs cracked and I, I had the wind knocked out of me no fewer than three times. And by the time I reached the far end of the room, nearest the exit, a tidal wave of books and encyclopedias and tomes and leather-bound and hardback collections had reached the crest and began to crash down in my direction in a tremendous and simply earth-shattering crash. I dodged left of the door and seconds before I was consumed, I threw it open and tumbled in ceremoniously into the next room and kicked it shut with a slamming click. And when I did, oddly, not a sound could be heard from the other side. No falling books or settling shelves or breaking things. It was as if all that had been in there in the first place was nothing at all. I gave myself a once over and a quick pat down to make sure nothing had broken or bruised, mercifully enough, and I allowed myself to rest and breathe. Holy shit, I said. Okay, okay, I'm okay. I'm here. I made it. After a moment of rest and regrouping, I looked around the sitting room I'd been in multiple times, and I remembered the instructions from the note. Like the fire in the living room. Okay, easy enough. Right, just need matches. And the wood. Something. I looked around the room and I found old newspapers, and kindling already in the floor of the fireplace. And above the mantel were matches. I took the last one from the box, swept it across the edge, and it produced me a small flame. I tossed it into the pit, but before I could even make for the kitchen, the flame caught and roared with stunning speed. Then a moment later, there was another swoosh. I swirled around and found the old fireplace in the room had been ignited too, and before I could process this development, its flame spread just as quickly and just as menacingly as the one from the first, and they leapt out of the gate and caught on the ratty old carpet and began to climb. The chimney in this dilapidated place had been so choked with soot too that the smoke spread right into the living room and began to fill it up. I hit the ground when I noticed this, and I began to crawl. But the fire was far, far faster than I was. Within a minute, it consumed the couch closest to the door. Then it reached the table. And then, that old, untreated wood went up all at once and cracked and crumbled and fell to ash. And soon, I felt those flames licking at my legs and bearing down on my back. And I gave up any effort to crawl and I stood up to begin to run. I leapt over the second couch in the table there, just as the ceiling cracked and tumbled in behind me. But when I reached the other furniture sets, the flames from the second fireplace that had already eaten it all away caught onto my trousers and climbed up the rest of me too. I was engulfed in a fire in seconds flat, and all of my screaming and all of my thrashing produced nothing for me then. Soon as my hair was singed off and my clothes burned away, and my skin itself began to bubble and boil and char and melt, it was excruciating to an indescribable degree, but I knew there'd be water in the kitchen, so with that last Last bit of my strength, I stumbled to the door, I opened, and I entered, and it shut behind me. And I stopped. And I patted myself down for the second time. I could breathe. And I had hair. And hell. 
I was utterly and completely untouched by fire. Even my clothes were only as unkempt as they normally were. I leaned up against the wood and I closed my eyes and I regrouped again. I opened my eyes. I was in the kitchen, as expected, and sure enough, it was as filthy and dilapidated as the rooms before it, if not considerably more so. The lights had long since snuffed out, and the wood was old, and it was, it was molded and rotted through, and the various hanging pots and all the appliances throughout were, were lopsided, broken. And then I saw my object on the corner. Eat from the fruit bowl. Pool room. And no longer was that bowl filled with fresh fruit, either. Instead, its contents were little more than molded, thoroughly rotted mush. A cloud of flies buzzed above and around it. I said aloud, hell no! Nope! No fucking way! But I knew, even as I spoke, I had no other way to escape. I approached the bowl, I squeezed my eyes shut tight and reached into it, past the swarming, feasting insects, and I grabbed what felt like it had once been an apple. And I breathed in and out several times, and I told myself it's temporary, like the fire. And I held my nose, and I ate the thing, and chewed it faster than I could taste, and swallowed it whole. To say the fruit was simply expired would be a profound understatement. It was filthy and so putrid and so thoroughly rancid that at least half of it stuck to my teeth and required me to lick it off or pull it out with my bare hands. I heaved, I retched, I nearly threw up, but I stopped myself before I did, unsure if doing so would void my accomplishment and require me to start the game over or eat more from the bowl, feast on my own vomit. So I swallowed the stuff. And I ran to the door, and I slammed it behind me. Fortunately, Labyrinth was merciful enough to purge the taste, too, but the memory remained. And once I was confident the contents of that stuff were out of my stomach, I released, but it wasn't yet, and I vomited onto the floor in a series of splats. Not like it did much for the decor of the place one way or the other. The billiard room was, like the others before it, profoundly decayed. The ceiling had caved in almost entirely, and the, and the pool table on which I had pocketed the eight ball, if memory served, was old and feltless. And while it had a stick on it, though, there were no billiard balls at all. Under my breath, I mumbled, oh, for fuck's sake, as the parameters of the upcoming search began to dawn on me. But then I heard something in the far corner of the room, the sound like something wet, a, a slurping, maybe, or a sucking, or a licking. I turned to look. At least they were the balls. The feet of an enormous, likely rabid, mange-ridden mastiff that had been feasting on them in the absence of proper food. Fortunately, the thing was fastened to the desk in the back, but how much yield the chain had, I was unsure. It saw me a second later, and when it did, it stood up and stared. And for a long moment, we did little else but eye each other up and down and sideways. I harbored few illusions about its intentions. With all its bared teeth and its, uh, its aggressive stance and those ropes of spit hanging from its jowls. Before making a move, I ran through a series of plans that would ideally get me in possession of the eight ball without having uh, to wrestle it out of the damn thing's paws. Among the rejected idea were one in which I used a pool cue to at the very least beat the dog unconscious from a distance before making for the ball, and one in which I tried to somehow distract it. Eventually, though, I decided to use a cue to not mess with the mastiff at all, but to try to roll the ball away, and any direction I could get them to move would be a victory, I reasoned. So, tossing the dog a piece of wood to bite on, I knelt down and I began to poke at the pile of slobber-covered billiard pieces. They scattered, but I was so focused at tapping the eight on its head and nudging it towards me that I didn't pay enough attention to the dog at all. It had ignored the wood. Turned out, and it lunged for my cue and grabbed it in its jaws and tossed it, and me with it, into the wall. 
I tumbled back onto the floor, and before I could regroup, that damn snarling barking hound was bearing down on me with full speed and monstrous demonic aggression. Its chain kept it from my neck at the very least, but after a panic struggle, it managed to clamp down on my ankle and drag me. With me howling and grasping for ground and digging into the wooden floorboards with my nails to no avail, back to the corner, two things happened that worked in my favor then. First, our wrestling sent the billiard pieces across the floor, the eight ball with them, and second, I managed to flip around and crack the beast in the jaw with my good foot before it got me back far enough to deliver a mortal strike. I broke free after that and limped over to the eight ball and placed it under the table and fetched a fresh cue from the wall. I lined up the shot, come on baby, come on, come on, come on, and knocked it in. Oh yes. But a half second later, the dog broke free of its chains and bounded over in my direction. I had an Olympic second to react. I flipped the table over to startle the Mastiff and made a mad dash for the exit while it made a mad dash for me. But it reached me first, unfortunately. It snarled and snapped and I held it by the throat an inch from mine. Its breath stunk like the end of the world, like rendered flesh and bone and disease and rot. I gagged and pushed and scrambled back towards the door and it pounced again and knocked me back down and began to bite at my bad leg for a second time. I screamed and I flailed and my, my hand found a pull cue that snapped under the toppled table. I grabbed it and jammed it into the dog's mouth and scrambled free while it yelped and pawed at its wound. I didn't wait to see how or if it released the wood. I simply limped into the coat room and I slammed the door shut. The pain subsided. Three rooms left. Three rooms left. Three rooms left. I opened my eyes after a bit and gave myself another pat down for good measure. I was intact. The corpse in the study indicated that these hazards weren't mere illusions, but things did at least appear to reset themselves whenever a door was closed. Assuming the player was on the far side of it. I looked around the coat room. A single naked bulb flickered in the center of the ceiling and provided just enough light to illuminate the coats, but not the floor. I didn't pay much attention to that, though. Once I remembered the instructions for proceeding, find the key in the pocket of the right coat. Actually, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of coats hanging in the place. Leather and tweed and business attire and windbreakers, and dusters, and countless other varieties. I started with the closest one. Nothing in the pocket but lint. Same thing awaited me in the pockets of the next four coats. But it wasn't until the fifth that I understood that it wasn't lint at all. Ow! What the hell? I took my hand out of the pocket and found there was a, a red welt ringed with a, a puncture wound in the center of it. I blinked and I turned back to the coat. It hung off a hanger and, and held it upside down until the contents of the pocket were emptied. I heard no clang indicating a key hitting the floor, but even in the poor lighting I could see the spider hit the ground and scurry off into the shadows. I looked at my hand. It had begun to swell and fester, and little more than ten seconds had passed since I'd been bitten. From that point forward, I opted to empty out the coats rather than reach into the pockets, and without fail, each and every one of them held at least one and as many as four spiders in each pocket. By the twentieth coat, there was a constant skittering around as the horde swept across the floor to and fro, this way and that, and over my boots and up my legs, and still no sign of the key, and by then I was losing my nerve. Ow, mother f I grabbed at my forearm and winced and found that another bite, uh, the culprit, had fled before I could return the favor. On my hand, the initial wound had swelled to the point that the whole limb felt heavy, and on my legs and ankles were a multitude more incisions. Whatever species of arachnid this was, they carried extremely potent venom in their fangs and quick-acting stuff to boot. I became sluggish after a dozen or so bites and then began to lose control of my muscles. I tripped over my feet and I, my breathing slowed and by the time I found the key in the right side pocket of the 41st coat I'd checked, I counted them as I went. I could hardly see straight at all. I caught the thing, but I, I collapsed no sooner than I did. And then came the horde. 
From the shadows behind me and in front of me and on both sides and above me, the spiders swarmed. Adrenaline alone kept my strength to get me back onto my feet, and even that was a challenge beyond anything that I'd encountered thus far. My body was covered in welts and sting bites. From head to toe, there were spiders in my hands, there were spiders in my shoes, there were spiders in my clothes too, all throughout and on my neck and in my face, and each and every one of the things were biting and feasting as I lumbered clumsily to the door. Each step felt like a mile. But by the time I thumped my right hand onto the knob and managed to, after excruciating effort, to insert the key, miraculously, I never once dropped it. Doing so would undoubtedly be a death sentence. The things were in my ears and in my nose and in my mouth. I tried to grit my teeth, but so inflamed were all of my facial muscles requiring me... To do that task, it was unable to stop the things from pouring into the opening and down my throat. I, I couldn't even gag. All I could do was throw every inch of strength that I had left in my body to the task of turning the knob and pulling open the door. And my wrists were so beaten and red and swollen that doing so felt like shattering bones. And when it was open, I then had to take steps with feet so enlarged that my shoes themselves felt ready to burst. The light from the next room, what little of it there was, spilled into the coat room and illuminated the bones of at least a dozen other souls who had never made it. I slammed the door shut behind me, and I collapsed and I gasped for air. As had always been the case, the wounds reset themselves, and I was in good health. Not a single spider crawled on my skin, or through my ears, or under my clothes, but like the rancid fruit, the memory remained. I screamed, what the fuck is this place, huh? There was no answer to that, of course. So in my rage, I walked up to the banquet hall table and I grabbed the closest chair and I tossed the thing with all my strength across the surface. Plates and cups flew to the ground and broke. There in a thousand pieces among all the other debris, the chair that I'd thrown simply tumbled across the length of the table and stopped at last into the end of it. A goblet stood fast at the far end, untouched, unweathered. Drink from the chalice. Portrait gallery. I didn't move for some time. I simply stared at the thing and I felt it was doing the same to me, not unlike the dog, and I was, I was unable to keep my mind from running wild through the possibilities of what it might contain. <laughs> Rancid milk, I thought. A cup of insects, maybe. Uh, fresh blood. At that point, I was so thoroughly exhausted and, and disheartened that the mere thought of drinking such vile content brought me to tears, but, but I put one foot in front of the other anyway, and I marched over to it, and although it was likely ill-advised, I peered inside. It took a while. It looked like wine, I saw. No. So I smelt it. It smelled like wine. Now I picked up the goblet and I, I swished the drink around a bit and I saw that it had the same consistency as wine too. I wiped my eyes, I set my resolve and I made sure to locate the exit behind me to the left. I held my nose and I drank the stuff. It tasted sweet, not like any form of alcohol as I expected, but sweet and thick and cool and refreshing. I downed the drink in its entirety, then I wiped my mouth, and no sooner did I turn towards the exit and form the thought, that was way too easy, what's the catch? Then I noticed that there were now, curiously enough, two exits. Not two exits in any concrete way, but with my vision swimming the way that it was, I realized there was two of everything, really. Two doors, two pairs of feet, four hands, two tables, two goblets. I thought, huh, that's weird. Then I collapsed onto the ground and was all at once and once again utterly unable to coordinate my movements and to think and to make sense of sight and to breathe. It was punishingly, achingly hard to breathe. In fact, each breath I drew in brought fire with it and before long, the Poison had swollen shut my throat until no air could pass through it at all. I tried to gasp for air, but I couldn't. I, I tried to reach into my mouth and pry open the airway, but got nowhere in that endeavor either. I, I retched and I convulsed and seized and clawed at my throat and made all the motions of, of gasping desperately without receiving any air at all. The last coherent thought I had was that 
As usual, salvation could be reached at the exit and nowhere else, so with my my body in revolt, I commanded it up, and I stumbled and wobbled and tilted and fell in the direction of that door and picked myself up and fell again, but a bit closer this time than with a knee full of splinters. Soon it hurt to take even that little, that little bit in that damn room, and every movement I made was agonized and cumbersome and burdened, but I'd come too far to give in now. Just as I began to black out, I reached the door, and I threw it open, and I fell through. Only when I slammed it shut, did I breathe again. <coughs> you haven't broken me yet, you fucks, I said. I coughed violently. Not yet. The portrait gallery awaited me now. Make it through. By now, I'd purged myself of illusions that any room in this demented place would be easy to solve. The more vague the instructions, the more difficult it'd be to follow, so... I looked around for potential hazards. I saw none. There were no spiders. There were no dogs. There were no fires. There were no poison or falling books either. There wasn't there wasn't even proper darkness in that place. It was as old and as broken as any room before, but a hole in the ceiling allowed the moonlight to pour in and bathe it. And in that light, all there was before me was a hallway lined with aged portraits. So I began to walk forward. Slowly and deliberately, with every hair on my neck and arm standing straight up. At first, there truly really was nothing to fear. But then I turned my attention to the paintings themselves, and I realized they all appeared to be aging. When I stopped, so did that process. But if I moved so much as an inch towards the end of the room, which itself was shrouded in darkness so thoroughly at the bottom, I couldn't see any door at all. And the figures would age. It wasn't profound or rapid, really, just... Little things here and there, a new wrinkle would appear, clothes would lose just a bit of their luster. The only one I could see for the entirety of my walk was that mighty centerpiece I had of the woman in blue. She aged a year a step as I walked, and when I entered the room, she was young, youthful, vibrant, with the sun at her back and a sparkling dress that matched the sky, but halfway through the room, even that sky had grown gray. Her hair was nearly white, her smile had fallen to a more tired countenance, and her dress was old and wrinkled and worn and faded. She looked terribly, terribly sad. And all at once I got the impression that I was killing her myself, that every step I took brought her closer to death. I paused for a breather after that, and for a time we stared at each other as I rested. I almost wish I could tell her how sorry I was. I took another step. Almost there, I told myself. Almost out. My hips stung. My breathing was heavy yet again. Although for entirely different reasons. And I began to sweat. I rubbed my, my hand across my forehead and my smooth scalp. I did my best to pace my... Why is my scalp smooth? I patted at the top of my head with both hands. Nothing up there but skin. Then I looked at my hands. They were... They were aged profoundly in just the few minutes since I'd entered the place. Wrinkled and veiny and liver spotted and simply, simply old. And all at once I was overwhelmed with dread and fear and anger and confusion. I looked back but knew there was nothing for me there. I could only go forward, but each step brought more pain and more anguish. My joints ached. My eyes became tired. I looked, I looked back up at the portrait at the three-quarters mark and saw the woman there was now in her 80s or 90s at the door of death without even the resolve to frown. I pushed forward and looked down and saw my clothes too had begun to weather in age. I now wore rags and barely that, I was it was exponentially falling apart. In the beginning of the room, each step aged me a month. Then a month became two months, then became three. By the middle of the room, I started aging a year each step and now each footfall brought me a decade or more. Soon I could no longer stand at all, but merely crawling, my elbows shook and wobbled at their last, still merely two or three running strides from where I imagined the door to be. It was still too dark to make out what waited in those shadows, but in eternity away in my condition, I collapsed. There was nothing left. I looked up one final time at the painting. All the flesh gone, only bones and dirt remained, and then... And then I too was a little more than bones. I'd never known true darkness until I passed in the labyrinth. There was nothing at all 
to see on the other side. Truly nothing. I, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. There, was, there wasn't so much as a dull spark at all to give me a sense of direction or context. I was simply floating in empty, unconstructed space, and although time had no meaning, here I felt vaguely that I had been there for a very, very long amount of time. Weeks, perhaps. Months, maybe years, decades, I wasn't sure. By the time the door presented itself to me, I'd long forgotten about the labyrinth. For even who or what I was, I simply opened it, like it was the most natural thing in the world, and inside I found a pillar of light that pulsed and beat to a steady rhythm, like a heart. And then, and then it came back to me. Find the heart to escape. And that flood and all the memories of that place, the changing rooms, the rapid decay, the books, and the fire, and the rancid food, and the dog, and the aging, and the door of death all at once, all of it, I willed myself forward and into the light, and, and I tumbled out into the grass. Then I looked up and I saw stars there. And I looked around and I found myself in front of the mansion at twilight. I felt a, a quick pang of relief and hope and instinctively I repressed it until my pat down was complete. And then I let it sing. I was alive, I was alive, and I was breathing, and I was young again, and I was unharmed, and for the first time in hours or, or days or however in God's name how long that I had been in that... I began to laugh and cry at the same time, and while I did, I ran away from that horrid place and, and through and past the gate and out into the field where my car was still parked. I made it home an hour or so later, and I, I fell into a deep and restful sleep. Suffice to say, the wretched experience in Labyrinth completely and utterly cursed me of my need to be thrilled by fear, and, and to you, I'll merely say this. If you ever get a black envelope in the mailbox, just toss the damn thing. Or better yet, burn it. Hey there, everyone who's listening on YouTube, or those of you who are listening on the podcast. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before you head out for the night, I just wanted to let you know about a couple of things. Without you, the show doesn't take place. So, if you guys would like to support the show, or if you guys would like to get your hands on a couple of cool little things whenever new things come out, check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, and any support that you guys show, I really appreciate it. So everyone who's already donated to the Patreon... I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. I thank you so much for that. If you guys are looking for more Creepypasta Storytime, there's a new video that's uploaded to this channel or uploaded to the podcast every Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday now. You can be able to get more from me at facebook.com slash mrcreepypasta or on Twitter at mrcreepypasta and then the number zero. Thanks so much for listening, kids, and for your support. And sweet dreams. <laughs>